Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. During the last snowstorm here, I had a really bizarre occurrence happen. There was a lot of high voltage across my antenna. Now, when I say high voltage, I mean that there was enough voltage to arc inside of a radio. And there's something that makes it even just a little bit more bizarre. There was about 30 some odd ohms DC resistance to ground where it was arcing and it was still arcing with that shunt to ground. I'll explain a little bit more about that, which makes this high voltage occurrence just a little bit strange. At any rate, I'll explain that and I'll show you on the schematic what I mean here in just a little bit. Now, I was lucky enough to grab my other camera and run back into the lab and catch a little bit of the sparking when it was kind of at its peak. It didn't last very long and it was pulsing and it was a lot of high voltage. If I had had a solid state radio hooked up to the coax at this time, it would have completely destroyed that solid state radio, would have probably fried the front end, maybe even the finals. In fact, the insulated coax was laying across the cord of a disconnected, so the switch was open on this, a disconnected desk lamp and it destroyed the LED bulb in the desk lamp as well. I got a really good zap off the coax as I was trying to get footage. That wasn't in the camera shot, but boy, was there a lot of, I, I would imagine, current behind it because it really made me jump back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you that footage that I managed to catch. I'll explain exactly how my antenna was hooked up to this and what was happening. And I'll explain that really bizarre occurrence, something that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So anyways, here's the footage. Enjoy. And then I'll explain a little bit about what was happening. The snow is falling outside. I think there's some light on that. And that's what's happening inside the radio as the snow's falling past the wire, it's creating static. And the heavier the snow, the more static there is on my antenna wire. And this is what destroys some solid state radios. So this is the FADA radio on the bench. As you can see here, I have it down to 1 16th, so it's a little slow, but I wanted to get the brightness in there. That's arcing quite a ways. It slowed down a lot. It was going crazy earlier. Pretty crazy amount of voltage there. So here's how this was hooked up when all of this was happening. So I have an antenna outside. It's a relatively large antenna and there's some coax that runs right up to the antenna. The shield of that coax splits off to one radial and the center conductor splits off to the other radial. That's a, a really long antenna and it's very high up. There's some coax that's running from that antenna down here into the lab. It's RG393. Runs all the way down the antenna and you know all the way into the lab here. And then it had a BNC connector attached to the end of the coax and then this little jumper cable here was attached to that coax. So the common of the antenna or the shield of the antenna was unhooked. This is the only lead that was hooked up to the radio when that sparking was happening. So the antenna is completely isolated. It's not grounded to anything in here. So the, the common side of the coax was just open at this point and it's just one radial really, or you know, one side of the antenna, which is attached to this. Now, how I discovered this and why it took so long for me to get footage is because I was in the video processing area and I'm starting to hear a very even clicking and popping noise in the speakers, in my video processing speakers. So the, the speakers are studio monitors and they are self-powered. So I unhooked all the cables to the studio monitors and they were popping just with no cables hooked up to them. So just a line cord obviously powering it, which is very interesting. So moving through the lab area, I'm hearing other speakers just sitting around popping. And I'm thinking to myself, this is really, really strange what's happening here. So I come down into the lab number two and I notice there's a really loud cracking noise. And I'm thinking something's got to be shorting out down in here. Maybe it's pulling the line voltage down and it's, you know, causing spikes. It's creating cracking or something like that. 
So I'm quickly moving around. Now, everything is powered down in lab number two. Nothing is hooked up. So I'm thinking, well, what could be cracking in here? This is really strange. Everything's switched off. So I get closer and closer to the bench, and this is the thing that's cracking. And what's happening is this right here, down in here, from this point of this coil, is arcing to the chassis, as you saw previously in the video. Now, what makes this even more strange is that this is a capacitor, so this is designed to block DC. And this point here, which is arcing to the chassis, is shorted to the chassis through 30 ohms of DC resistance in this coil already. So technically this coil should just be dragging this off to ground. So any of you that are RF engineers out there are knowing what I'm saying right now. This is a very strange occurrence because there is 30 ohms, about 36 ohms through this coil right to the chassis. And I'll show you that here in just a moment. So there's only one lead attached from the antenna outside to this. Now, of course, this is a tuned circuit. You know, when I'm moving this around, this is tuned. So kind of an interesting little thing right there. So odd, but at any rate, so this is isolated from everything. The line cord was plugged into an isolation transformer. So there is no connection to the mains at all. Like this is 100% isolated. So it was arcing to the chassis. So somewhere in the isolation transformer, it must have been arcing as well because it would have to find you know a ground path somewhere, right? It would have to arc somewhere. And looking at the size of the spark, and of course, you know how I got bit from that, uh, there is a lot of current there. So it, it would have had to have been arcing in that isolation transformer. And it may have been using the, the actual wiring as an antenna itself, which is a very, very odd thing. So I'll show you the resistance here. I'll just uh, turn on the meter. And I'll remove these two tubes. It just uh, makes things a little easier to get into. So I can't measure it from here because there's a blocking capacitor there. So that only allows, you know, AC or those radio signals through. But I can measure it from where it was arcing to the chassis. So I'll just uh, put this up here, like so. One, meet, one lead of the meter. And I'll touch to the point to where it was arcing. And you can see it's 36 ohms to ground. So you would think that 36 ohms would have just taken that charge and just, you know, brought it to ground. There wouldn't have been arcing. So it was arcing from this point right here to the chassis, as you saw, and doing that with a, a parallel resistance of 36 ohms to ground. Again, any of you RF engineers out there will understand the strangeness of this whole situation. While this is doing this, it didn't hurt the radio at all. There's nothing wrong with the radio. The coil's fine. You can see it's still its original color and everything. There's no shorts in the coil or anything. So very, very strange occurrence. Now, of course, that leads me to thinking, okay, so somehow something had to have been jumping inside this capacitor to make that happen. This capacitor must have been arcing or something like that. And if it wasn't arcing, maybe it was passing RF. So if it was arcing inside, it would be destroyed and it would show leakage in there, especially with that amount of current. So if I get this out of the way and I grab my extremely sensitive capacitor leakage tester. So since one end is attached to ground, okay, I'll just turn this on. I'll leave this on forecast. So that's the most sensitive setting there is. Since one of the, uh, the since one end of that coil is attached to ground, I can just attach the, uh, positive of the meter here to the chassis so it'll get the coil like that and then it'll come through the coil come through here and then back up to here I should be able to measure this capacitor because that's the only thing in the circuit so if there's any leakage this won't count down and this thing is incredibly sensitive so just to give you an idea I'll hold on to the rubber boot right here and I'll just touch the chassis so I'm not touching anything metal this is through this boot it's actually a vinyl boot and I touch this here I gotta go on to test first before I do this if I just touch this, you can see it's just ever so slightly just touch the chassis. It's measuring the resistance of my body through a vinyl boot. That's how sensitive this meter is, right? So if there's going to be any leakage, this is going to detect it. So I'll clip this onto here. And as you can see, this is on the forecast setting here. This is incredibly sensitive. So the fact that this is counting down with that capacitor right now, tells me, you'll see a green light here in a moment, there's no leakage there whatsoever. So this XY rated safety capacitor is just fine after all of this was happening. And there's obviously thousands of volts in there jumping across there. 
So very, very interesting. Let's shut this off. Get that out of the way. So very, very interesting scenario here. And that's what's happened here. I'm trying to think of any other facts I can tell you. As, um, you know, I'm just telling you exactly what I've seen here. I think that's basically about it for what was happening on the chassis here. So again, this is a, a, a tuned circuit. You know, like as you're tuning the dial on the radio, there's a portion here that tunes the antenna at the same time. So technically I'm tuning something. Now, at this point, I really didn't want to touch the radio chassis because this is isolated through an isolation transformer. So there's going to be a charge that's going to be building up on here. There were no Bakelite knobs on the radio at the time, so I couldn't tune this to see if I could tune the spark out. Maybe, you know, if, if it was RF, I would have been able to tune it out. This obviously some, maybe some sort of a freak occurrence. Uh, it's uh, really, really strange. Some high-powered RF coming in. Who knows? Very, very strange. Very, very strange occurrence. So, in just a moment here, I'll tell you what I've got going on in the next frame here and uh, how I'm set up for capturing this if this does happen again i've actually put quite a bit of time into uh, making a device that will allow me to capture this if this does happen i just about forgot to show you the desk lamp this is the desk lamp that got affected by what's going on so again the coaxial cable was laying over the line cord the switch to the desk lamp was off so this desk lamp was not on when all of this happened and that isolation transformer where the radio was most likely finding, you know, a path to ground in was plugged in right beside this. So the line cords were running very close together and everything like that as well. So maybe somehow there was some arcing in there. Who knows what happened, but this is what happened to the lamp. So what I'll do is I got to darken the camera up here so I can turn this on because it's a very, very bright lamp. Turn the lamp on and it takes just a few moments for this to happen here. And you'll see that not just one string goes out, but you'll see multiple ones go out. Now, without the filter on on my camera, this is really flashing like crazy on this end here. It's it's uh, very, very fast. You're seeing what the frames of the camera is catching right now. One thing that's very odd about this, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, it's just the bulb itself gets extremely hot. So what I'm gonna do here is I'll just shut this off and I'll brighten things back up again. So this gets extremely hot. So just from that little occurrence there, this bulb is very, very, very hot. So very lucky I didn't have the uh, coax coming into this lab here because I might be down a whole bunch of uh, solid state test equipment. So that's what it did to the bulb. So I'll tell you about what I did to try and capture this if this happens again in the future here, just in the next shot. I now have multiple pieces of equipment attached in lab number two, just in case an occurrence like this happens again. I've even gone to the trouble to create a special coupling device from the coax to the test equipment that will provide protection to the test equipment because there's multiple pieces attached now and provide enough coupling so that I can get signals through so I can really see what's going on. Whenever I'm doing experiments like this or any type of work with high voltage, I always use this older equipment because it's very resilient. Since we really don't know the type of voltage and current that's available on that coax at this time, this is an extra step in safety. If I was to attach that directly to any modern piece of test equipment, it would absolutely 100% destroy it. Whether it's a scope, spectrum analyzer, frequency counter, it would just destroy it. Whereas this stuff is extremely resilient. As you saw in that 1930s radio, the sparking was happening right there with the radio connected. The radio is absolutely fine, didn't even harm the coil. And this older test equipment is much like that. That's why it's still around and it works very, very well. Modern oscilloscopes and spectrum analyzers and things like that, a lot of them have application-specific ICs or ASICs in the front end, things like that, special switches, you know, things to keep impedances the same and everything like that. And they're very touchy and delicate, whereas something like this, if something goes wrong, all I have to do is just unthread this right here, like you see. Long screw. And take out the whole front end of the oscilloscope and I can service this right on the bench. 
And as you can see in this, the parts and pieces in here are much like what's in that older radio. So very easy to service, put back together, and if anything happens, this thing is you know, up and running in no time whatsoever. That's the reason I have lots of this older stuff like you see right here. So if I discover anything, you will all be the first to know. I will release this to all of you. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that. And if you're enjoying this video, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up. Hang around, there'll be a lot more very interesting stuff like this coming in the near future. And if you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and getting access to my inventions, designs, and custom pieces of test equipment that I have not released to the public, it's been released on Patreon. You're definitely going to want to check that out. I'll put the link just below the video's description under the Show More tab, and I'll also pin the link at the top of the comments section. I've also released a very collectible 2020 Mr. Carlson's Lab calendar with photograph quality pictures in that calendar of many of the projects that have been here on the bench. That link will also be under the Show More tab. You can click on the link, it'll take you there, and you can flip through the pages of the calendar and see the quality of the pictures in that calendar. It's really, really quite amazing, quite astounding. Great, great looking pictures. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.